Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Bennington, Vermont. Uh, for those of you who are here, I know you already know that. Uh, at the same time, we broadcast uh, online and through CAT TV, and so there may be some watching the delayed broadcast who are not familiar with our church, but uh, regardless of how you're with us today, we are glad to have you with us. For any who might not uh, know me, I'm Dr. Alan Ingalls. I teach uh, Hebrew and Old Testament here at Northeastern Baptist College here in Bennington. And um, my wife and I are members of this church. And since we're without a pastor right now, there are several men. I'm one of those who fills the pulpit in between, and it's always a delight and a privilege for me to bring the Word of God to you on a Sunday morning. We want to take time now for our music meditation. The music meditation is a time for us to, to pause, to calm our hearts, to reflect, to focus our minds on the worship that we have come to do. And so let's pause for a moment for the music meditation. Those are powerful words. Great is thy faithfulness. Some of you know where that comes from. It comes from Lamentations chapter 3, a book which reflects on the destruction of Jerusalem when God judged Judah for its sin. And yet, in the midst of, of reflecting on the destruction of the city and all of the pain and sorrow that went with that, the writer of Lamentations, probably Jeremiah, said, great is thy faithfulness. Through it all, God is faithful. Words to consider this morning. Our call to worship, I've taken from Psalm 100, verses one through three, 
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Let's pray. Father, as we come to worship you today, uh, we are mindful of the fact that we often fail. We often sin. And yet, through your faithfulness, through your mercy, you sent your son, Jesus, to die in our place. We just pray that you'll help us to focus on your goodness, your mercy, your love as we worship today, as we hear your word, as we sing hymns that have been sung by the church sometimes for many, many years, as we pray and and do the other things that are part of our worship. We pray that you would be honored and glorified through everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number three, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Hymn number three, and you can stand with me if you would like.
may be seated. We come now to our time of confession. Uh, as I mentioned in the opening prayer, we, we fail, we sin, even as Christians every day. And as we come before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, we need to acknowledge to him our sins, our faults, our failings. He already knows. But we have to clear the air with him and restore our fellowship with him as in 1 John 1, 9. So our call to confession this morning is taken from Psalm 103. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Boy, should hear a whole chorus of amens at that. I mean, otherwise, the first time we sin, God would just zap us down dead, and that'd be the end of it, wouldn't it? God is gracious and merciful. So let's pause for a moment of silent confession as we appeal to our King for his mercy. Our assurance of forgiveness is taken from the same Psalm, verses 11 and 12, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. Our scripture reading. I, I've put in the bulletin chapter 2, verses 1 through 23, but reading this morning, decided that's a little bit long. So we're going to read verses 5 through 11 and verses 19 through 23 from this chapter, and we will be covering the entire chapter in our time in the Word in a few moments. So chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. Now, there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many women, young women, were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Verse 19, now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. 
and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's sing together hymn number 314. Blessed assurance. You may stand with me if you wish. You may be seated. As you know, we aren't passing the plate in these days. We do have a plate down here at the front. If you brought an offering to uh, help with the expenses of the ministry, then you can certainly put that in after the service if you didn't get a chance to put it in before the service. But we still want to take time for the offertory because it's a time for us to stop and consider what God has done for us and how he would have us to join him in the work here in this community.
Thank you. You may be seated. We want to take some time for prayer, prayer for our nation, for our community, for our church. I'm not much of a sports fan. Uh, I, I really didn't like sports in school. I was this little skinny kid who got beat half to death in every sport we played, you know, even the ones that weren't supposed to be rough. Yeah, didn't become much of a sports fan. We lived in Dallas, Texas for a while. And it, they have this team in Dallas. I don't know if you've heard of it. The Cowboys, right? It was a big thing when we were down there. Everything was Cowboys, Cowboys. They won some championships or something. I don't know. Not a big sports fan. When we moved to Nebraska, we got hooked on Husker football. Yeah, you cannot live in Nebraska and not be a Huskers fan. It's just not allowed. And we still root for the Huskers, and even though they haven't been doing real good the last few years. So the last Super Bowl was the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles. So who do I root for? I ain't got a dog in that fight. So I vote, I root for the one whose mascot I like. <laughs> now you choose a team, you like the mascot or their colors. It's, it's crazy. Sometimes you just root for the underdog, right? You don't care whose the teams are that are playing, but you know, one of them is, is, is the clear underdog. You, you root for the underdog because you would just love to see the underdog upset the hot shots, see them get theirs. We're kind of like that in the book of Esther. We, we don't know what's going on yet. The writer of Esther is setting up the story. We know we don't like Ahasuerus. He's pretty much of a scum-sucking bottom feeder. That's a nice way of putting it. Vashti. You know what? She looked like she could have, could have been a hero. You know, she was willing to stand up to Ahasuerus. But now she's out of the picture. Hmm. What's going to happen next? Well, let's see. God is still setting up the story. He's putting the pieces in play, in place, long before they're actually needed. Let's take a look at chapter 2. God prepares Esther to be queen. He actually appoints her as queen in chapter 2. In the first four verses, King Ahasuerus gets the suggestion of how to find a new queen. After these things, after the big party when Vashti was banished, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the capital, under custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given to them, and let the young, women, young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. God hasn't been mentioned in the book. Has he? You think back. You realize God is not mentioned directly even one time in the book? That's, that's one reason why the early Jews weren't sure to include the book in the Old Testament. They weren't sure. And yet, if you look at the history of Israel and the things that have gone on before, and you know the back story, you go, Wow, God is there. God is there on every page. 
you say, someone might read the story and say, well, that's a coincidence. Yeah, coincidence with a capital G. God is at work. And so you have this, this nasty king, a king who Eugene Merrill says, after his failure at uh, the Battle of Thermopylae, returns home to, to live a life of licentious indulgence. He was a rich, spoiled playboy. And so he sobers up after the party, sometime after the party. We don't know how long it is. It says, you know, he remembered what he had done. Well, yeah, he sobered up. And so then he doesn't know what to do. I don't have a queen. And so the young bucks that attend him have an idea. And this sounds just like the Rehoboam story. Remember Solomon's son, Rehoboam? The people came to Rehoboam after Solomon passed away and they said, your father put a really, really heavy tax burden on us. And if you're willing to ease up on that, we would be glad to serve you. And Rehoboam talked to the old men, the wise old men, and they said, they're right. You need to, to ease up. And then Rehoboam talked to the young bucks that hung around, that were his buddies, his friends. And they said, no, you tell them that, you know, if you thought my dad was hard, you're, just wait. I'm going to get you. And guess who he listened to? He listened to the young bucks that were his buddies. And he split the kingdom. This, this sounds just like that. Anybody reading Esther that knew the backstory, knew the history of Israel would go, ha, 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 I can see where this one's going to go. This is not a good thing. But the young bucks that serve Ahasuerus, they say, let's do a nationwide beauty pageant. Send out officials into all 127 of your provinces from India to Ethiopia and let them bring in beautiful young women and let them go through a period of preparation. And you pick one. And see, this, this is totally different than the way things were done in the Persian Empire. Normally, the queen was chosen from the families of one of the seven princes of Persia, the seven probably who are mentioned back in chapter one. Oh, no, we're not going to do it that way. Ahasuerus, <clears throat> scum-sucking bottom feeder that he is, wants a beauty pageant. And these young bucks, I mean, he loves the suggestion. Yeah, let's do it. So just as with Vashti, he turned that into a nationwide crisis. And he sends out these instructions, these uh, proclamations to all of his 127 provinces about men being ahead of their houses. Looks like a petty child stomping his feet. And now he needs to find a queen and, hey, let's go nationwide. See, he just naturally goes this direction. So he suggests this. And as you wear, likes the idea, so he apparently does it. That's the setup. Now we get to meet the hero, heroes. Because really in the book, Esther and Mordecai are both heroes. Let's look. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So we have this Mordecai. 
And we have his lineage all the way back to Kesh, all the way back to Benjamin. Now, Kish, oh, that name sounds familiar. Saul. Mordecai is a relative of Saul. That doesn't seem terribly important to us, but later in the story, that's going to become really important. Mordecai family, not him personally, it has been 120 years since Jeconiah was taken into captivity in 597. So clearly Mordecai was not actually carried away in the captivity. His family was. It's been 120 years. But Mordecai was apparently from a very important family because if you look back at the history of when Jeconiah was deported by King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar took a number of the most important people into captivity. This wasn't a general exile of anybody he could get his hands on. And so Mordecai is probably a pretty important guy in terms of the, the Israelite aristocracy. Clearly a son of Benjamin, a son of Kish. He's related to Saul. This Mordecai was living in Susa, the capital, and he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. Hadassah is a good Jewish name. It means myrtle tree. It's a popular Jewish name for girls because myrtle trees are beautiful trees. Fragrant flowers. Nice name for a girl. Hadassah. And then Esther is a Persian name. Probably a form of the Persian word for a star. Not a bad name for a girl either. In the rest of the book, she's going to be referred to as Esther by her Persian name. But this lets us know right off, here's a, here's a good Jewish girl with a good Jewish name, even though they've been in captivity for 120 years. She has a good Jewish name. But her parents are gone. And she was raised by Mordecai, her uncle's, uh, let's see, she is his uncle's daughter. That would make her first cousin, right? Do I have that straight? Does that first and second cousin business always gets me. She's his cousin. And yeah, he's taken her in and he's raised her. And apparently, as you read through the book, you know, he's apparently done a pretty good job of it. Mordecai and Esther. So, verse 8, when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. Now, if you remember anything about the colonial days, the British had a custom that when their ship was in port somewhere, they could send a press gang ashore and they could force any young man they found into service on their ships. And that's how they replenished their crews. So if they had lost some crew members for whatever reason, through desertion or death or battle, they could just send a crew ashore and they would scoop up any strong young men that they could find and press them into service. It's called a press gang. And so in coastal cities, if you saw a British man of war coming into harbor, what did you do? If you were a young man, it was time to hide. Get out of the way because you do not want to get dragged off and just, I mean, you don't get to say goodbye to your family or change your shoes or anything. I mean, you're just, 
hauled out to the ship and you're now a British sailor. That's, that's kind of what's going on here. These people are charged with going out and finding beautiful young women for the king. And Esther lives in the capital. So I mean, it's hard to hide. And she is, we'll be told shortly, very, very beautiful. And she is pressed into service. She is hauled off to the harem. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and even seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. As you, as you read through the, this book, you'll see everybody loved Esther. Esther was just kind of the person that everybody liked. And so when Haggai, who is a eunuch in charge of the harem, he just, he likes her. Aside from the beauty thing, he likes her. And so he gives her all her, her portions, her cosmetics, all the stuff for preparing, um, and uh, gives her seven young servant girls to attend her. I'm guessing the way that they put this, that's more than was usual. And he advances her to the best place in the harem. She just rises to the top wherever she goes. Quite a young lady. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. So you see what's going on. They're in exile. They've been in exile a long time. I'm sure the, the king knew about Jews. They were one of the peoples that, that populated his city. And Mordecai, for whatever reason, it, the text doesn't tell us why, he told Esther, you keep that quiet. Now, what happened with Daniel and his friends? Remember what happened? The first thing they faced was, okay, here's the king's food. Eat. And Daniel and his friends were determined to keep the Jewish food laws. And they said, we can't, we can't eat some of that stuff. Remember the problem that they ran into. Esther is advised by Mordecai to keep her, her kinship, her origin a secret. And she does, which means she probably was not keeping kosher. She was probably not following the Jewish food rules. It's interesting that the book doesn't say anything about that. It just overlooks that. For whatever reason, in this situation, that was the best thing for her to do. But this is interesting. She is raised by her cousin. And yet, even when she's taken into the palace, he warns her, keep that quiet. And she does. She's a submissive young woman. And she submits to the advice of her cousin Mordecai, who raised her. I like her more and more. Quite a young lady. And Mordecai, you know, once she's taken into the harem, apparently Mordecai cannot communicate directly with her, especially since nobody knows yet that they're related. And so what does he do? He wants to know how she's doing. He's worried about her. And so he hangs around in front of the harem he knows which building they're being kept in. 
And he probably hangs around now and then, talking to people who are coming and going. There's probably servants coming and going and bringing food and all this stuff all the time. And he starts schmoozing them up. Because he wants to know how Esther's doing. See, he really cares about her. See the setup? You see where this is going? Esther and Mordecai. Good people. So in verses 12 through 14, we get a picture of how this beauty pageant is going to go. Now, when the turn came for each woman to go into Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period for their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. When the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Sheshgaz, yeah, Sheshgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. So, 12 months of preparation. Talks about beautification and, and, and uh, you know, all the perfumes and things that they gave her. Undoubtedly, some of these women were from far away and Persian was not their native language. And so they had to learn Persian. They had to learn court etiquette, courtly manners. But they had this period of a year. And then at the end of the year, these women started going to the king. And they had a kind of a prospect's harem. And then they had a concubine's harem. And they were prospects. And they would spend the night with the king. You can fill in the blanks. And then the next morning, they would go to the concubine harem. Because they now belonged to the king. They could not just go out and marry anybody. Concubine was a, a legal status in the ancient world, about halfway between a wife and a servant. They did not have quite as many rights as a wife did, but still they weren't like a servant that they could just be bought and sold at will. So each of these women, how many are there? Josephus, the Jewish historian, says there were about 400. And that sounds like a huge number, but I mean, think about Solomon's harem. You think about the fact that he sent officials out into every one of his 127 provinces to gather women. That may be a small number. And so this process goes on for quite a while, maybe more than a year. What a horrendous thing. Because once a woman is taken into the harem, she's cut off from her family, she's cut off from her life. Her hopes of getting married and having children are very small because once She's had her night with the king. She's now in the concubine's harem. And she never even gets to see him again unless he calls for her. So this selfish pig, I mean king, has ruined the lives of many, many women, maybe hundreds, at a whim. This is no ordinary beauty pageant. This is the process that Esther is going through. How does she handle it? Take a look, beginning at verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her his own daughter to go to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. 
Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to the king as you wear us into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the, tenth, the month of Teveth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. She goes in. Haggai, the head of the, the women's harem, has advised her on what to take with her and how to behave. And again, she's submissive. She does what he suggests. And everybody who, who likes her, just everybody who sees her likes her. Quite a young lady. And the king immediately falls in love with her and makes her queen. What a fairy tale ending, right? Well, if the, if the story ended there, maybe so. But God is setting her up to be in the right place at the right time, which we'll see as we go on. But King Ahasuerus now makes her king. The seventh year of his reign, the month of Teveth, is basically December, January. And so this is about four years after the original banquet in chapter 1, which was in the third year of Ahasuerus. Quite a bit of time has passed. Ahasuerus has already fought the Battle of Thermopylae at this point and failed. And has gone home to live the life of a spoiled playboy. Then the king gave a great feast for all the officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the uh, provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. He gave lavish gifts, tax breaks, banquet. Wait a minute. Wasn't there a banquet back in chapter 1? Get used to the idea that in the book of Esther, banquets are going to be important turning points. Vashti was banished at a banquet. Esther is now promoted and given a banquet. Banquets are going to be little red flags saying, notice me, notice me, notice me. Just like in the book of Genesis, when someone meets a girl at a well, guess what's going to happen? Yeah. Finding a wife. In Esther, it's a banquet. Then we have this little section. Have to be quick here. That looks out of place. It looks like it doesn't belong in the narrative here, but it's so important to set up what comes next. Now, when... The virgins were gathered together the second time. Nobody is sure, certain exactly what that means. Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. That doesn't mean he's a bum just hanging around. Sitting at the king's gate meant he was an important official in the king's administration. That's where business was done, and the king's business was done at the king's gate. And so you paid your taxes at the king's gate, and you got your you know, your vehicle registration at the, at the king's gate, you know, or you paid your parking fine for parking your chariot in the wrong place at the king's gate. That's where important business was done. And so Mordecai is apparently a pretty important dude in the king's administration. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him, still submitting to, to Mordecai's advice and instructions. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, eunuchs who guarded the threshold. Okay, so these are eunuchs, but these are serious dudes. These are guards. These guys are armed. 
they became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. They wouldn't be the last ones to want to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And as history tells us, he was eventually assassinated by either disgruntled palace officials or a jealous husband. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. Mordecai is a faithful servant of the king, and he passes word through Esther. Now, he may not have actually been able to, to communicate directly with Esther. He may have had to use an intermediary, but the, the story doesn't get into the details. He passed word to Esther, and Esther who we'll find out later, can't just waltz into the king's presence anytime she feels like it. Probably had to talk to one of the guards and pass the word. Those are minor details, and the, the author just kind of skips over those. But Mordecai passed the word to Esther, and Esther passed the word to the king, and they did an investigation, and sure enough, those two guys were up to no good. And they were executed. Now, when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. Now, when we think of gallows, we think of hanging with a rope, neck, strangulation. That's not what it's talking about. It's an unfortunate translation in all of our modern translations. What would happen in the ancient world is you would, you would take someone and execute them by whatever means your culture liked, like, beheading or whatever, and then you would impale their bodies on a post for everyone to see as a warning. That's probably what happens here. If they were impaled like the Assyrians did do, the Assyrians would impale people alive on a post to die. It might have been that way, but this is also going to become important because the gallows are going to come up again in the book. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king, or at the request of the king. Translation's a little difficult there. So this is duly recorded. That's going to come up again, too. This little snippet shows us that Mordecai and Esther were faithful servants of the king and reliable sources of information. That becomes very important later in the story. So there's a lot of foreshadowing going on here where they're kind of telling us a little bit about what's going to happen next. Kind of like in your favorite cop shows when you know, the music changes and you know something's coming. That's what this part of the story does. So the story is set up now. Stay tuned next time for the villain. The villain comes creeping in. Can't wait. Guess we've got to. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we, as we study the book of Esther, as we work our way through this book, you will help us to see that none of this happened by chance, that you were at work every step of the way, setting your people up to take care of their own, protecting your people, taking care of them. Pray that this will be an encouragement to us for just as, as the words of Jeremiah in, in uh, the book of Lamentation or encouragement to us, great is thy faithfulness. The book of Esther lets us see that faithfulness at work. Pray that we'll be encouraged through that this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing together hymn number 380, 380. Living for Jesus. Thank you.
depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Do we have any announcements as we close? No announcements? Le coup, le coup, le shalom. Go in peace.